face to them. Part of the taste of Emsworth. Well, hello there. And thank you for joining me for my talk about Emsworth and the rise and fall of its oyster industry. We're going to go back in time. First of all to the Roman conquest, then Saxon and Norman, and finally Victorian times. And we'll see how the industry grew from nothing into a multi-million pound business employing over 400 people in Emsworth. <laughs> we did so well that we invested that money in town facilities, a new town hall, a, a fire station, a hospital, and even a new sewage system. However, overnight in 1902, the whole industry collapsed, putting everyone out of work and losing their income. Even worse, we were going to be fined because of some of the things that we'd done to improve the town. So let us go back, first of all, to the Roman era and find out how the oyster industry started. And we know this because of an excavation work that we've done quite recently. In 2018, the Chichester Archaeological Society started a dig in a field on the western side of Emsworth. This followed the discovery of a few Roman artefacts in a field being used by the farmer. Okay, this is uh, an example of one of the many oyster shells that we found on this site. The Romans ate them uh, as, uh, as an ordinary food. Uh, we have found an awful lot of oyster shells. We, they don't unfortunately tell us very much about the, from the archaeological point of view, but it does give us some indication of how their diet was made up. By the time we'd finished the dig, uh, we'd found a pretty substantial Roman villa. It included underfloor heating and quite a few rooms. And you heard about the oysters as well. Um, so we're starting to think that perhaps it was a sort of halfway lodge, somewhere where people could stay overnight. Um, essentially, the field uh, is halfway roughly between two Roman facilities. One to the uh, west was a fort uh, near where present-day Porchester is. And uh, to the east is Chichester, of course, which was a town as well in Roman times. So this well could have been somewhere where people stayed overnight and had oysters on the menu. Let's move on now to uh, the Saxon period. And we know something about this because of some uh, development in Emsworth. In the 1960s, a developer moved in and started constructing an area known as Beacon Square uh, uh, for housing. This was on a field on the west side of Emsworth called Seafields. You can see on this photograph here, it's quite close to the foreshore. And while they were building the foundations for these houses, they discovered the remains of some Saxon buildings, uh, possibly big enough to be a small village. However, we now think it was probably was a summer camp because this foreshore area around Emsworth is a bit subject to flooding during the winter. This photograph shows you the other side, uh, the east side, and you can see um, in modern times that the River Ems at times can overflow and flood the area. OK, we've looked at Saxon times, now let's move on to Norman times. And we know something about the area because of the Doomsday Book. Now the Doomsday Book was written when the Normans invaded. It was called the Great Survey and of course it was mainly for raising taxes. It was completed in 1086. And looking at this book we find reference to a mill in the manor of Warblington. Now, actually, Emsworth, therefore, did not exist in this time, uh, but it was part of Warblington. And the manor of Warblington was established by then and later on became quite well known uh, during the Tudor times and even during the Civil War. <laughs> 
So, as we can see, Emsworth didn't exist uh, at this particular time. Uh, so, at the beginning of the Norman reign, nothing really had happened in Emsworth. So, I'm quickly going to go through some of the developments in this period. First of all, um, we know that King John granted the manor of Emilsworth. Now, Emilsworth is Saxon, uh, meaning Emils, the owner, and Worth meaning an enclosed place or homestead, most probably a farm. So we knew at least that existed then. By the beginning of the 13th century, Henry III granted a market charter to Emilsworth. So we can see the, the, the first developments of a town. By the beginning of the 14th century also, Emilsworth had fishing valued for tax purposes at about 6 shillings and 8p, which in those days was a fair amount of money. We also know it was one of five landing points within the port of Chichester. Another thing that you might find interesting is that the Lordship of Emilsworth was then purchased by a wool merchant in about the middle of the 14th century. Uh, that was important because it was the beginning of Emsworth as a commercial centre. <laughs> we also know that a commission was investigating us for smuggling of goods, not as you might think from France to England, but the other way around. Right, uh, a brief history now of Emsworth over the 16th and 17th century. For example, we know that in 1503 there was a mullet fishery in the estuary of the River Ems. Now today that's part of the Slipper Mill Pond on the east side of Emsworth. And if you go there in the spring, you'll actually see that the mullets come back and spawn their eggs. So for hundreds of years, the fish have come back to Emsworth to raise their young. We also know that the population of the town was about 100 and uh, at the turn of the century there are the indications of boat building going on in the town. Now um, we also know that uh, by the 17th century there was a coal yard in Emsworth and because of the hearth tax, that's the way they calculated taxes in those days, there were 58 households in Emsworth uh, and that meant I reckon about 220 people. On top of that, we built a bridge over the River Ems, so that meant transport in and out of the town had become a lot better. I also found the first map that shows Emsworth. It was about in the middle of that century. And if we zoom in to the top right-hand side, you'll see it's got some actual detail of the layout of the houses, and also that the name has changed by then from Emsworth to Emsworth. I also wanted to draw your attention to that little island in the, in the bay. It's called Fowley Island and this will become important later on in my story because they used to store oysters there. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. Here it is in real life and if you have a close look at it you'll see some faint lines on it because in Victorian times this was used as a um, oyster pen area. So as well as the foreshore of the town, they kept oyster pens on the island. And again, looking much more closely at the map, you can see that there is the remains of a footpath uh, which went from the foreshore at Emsworth right into Fowley Island. Here we are with a photograph of the, ta um, uh, the uh, path as it is today. Now you can only see this at a certain time of the tide level, about 2.6 metres. When the water is lower, then you can't see the path at all. And when the water is higher, it's covered over by water. And as you can see, it's rather fallen into uh, disuse. In fact, it's impossible to walk all the way to Fowley Island, although you can go out quite a distance uh, towards the island at, when the tide's just right. We're going to put all of that information together now, the, the map we have, uh, the taxes, uh, and draw a sort of picture of Emsworth in the middle of the 17th century. And I think this is what the layout of the town would have been. We're now going to move into the 18th century, and this really is a critical time in the history of our town Emsworth. <laughs> 
So by the beginning of the 18th century, we come to a turning point for the town, and coastal trading is key to this, because someone called Thomas Hendy moved from Havant and purchased the quay at Emsworth. He was the master of a trading vessel that carried grain. So by the middle of the century, we had uh, two keys, the Slipper Mill Key, which is at the bottom of uh, South Street, and Hendy's Key at the other side of Emsworth, no longer there because a house has been built on the site. And we had uh, mills owned by its merchants, in fact four of them. Two were powered by the river, and two were powered by river and tidal mill ponds, more of which I'll tell you about later. So let's look at the number of vessels coming into Emsworth. This had built up from uh, towards the end of the 18th century, only 48 ships, and by 1813, just over 200 vessels were coming into Emsworth with their cargoes. And this is reflected in the number of ships uh, using Emsworth compared to other quays within Chichester Harbour. So Emsworth was getting just over 50% of all the shipping coming in, whereas Del Quay had fallen considerably. And this again is because of our commerce. Uh, the Emsworth Quays were owned by businessmen who kept costs down to a minimum, while at Del Quay it was government owned uh, and it was much more expensive to use. Right, we're now going to move into Victorian times. So we're looking at 1837 right up to the turn of the century. So what was the position? We talked about how busy Emsworth was getting. Let's look at some of the cargoes. Uh, coming in were barley from uh, Norfolk, coals from Newcastle. And by the way, if you know Emsworth, in South Street, we have a pub called the Coal Exchange. And it got its name because that's where the captains of these boats would come up to and negotiate to trade their cargo of coal from Newcastle for flour or malt uh, from our local mills. I've mentioned boat building. That was already underway and it was thriving by now. King's Boatyard. It's gone now, but um, uh, the road that goes past it, King's Road, is named after it. And the owners, George Norris and John King, were building substantial boats right up to 250 tons. Let's now look at fishing in Emsworth. In 1788, about 12 fishing boats were operating out of the harbour. But by the middle of the 19th century, 50 fishing boats were operating. And as you can see from this graph, the number of oyster and scallop catchers had gone up enormously. In fact, uh, Charles John Longworth of Haven said, there is a new peak of posterity for Emsworth oysters. However, of course, things were starting to go wrong because of overfishing. 22 Emsworth fishermen were arrested and eight of these were jailed for illegally dredging. The problem being that the owners of the oyster beds had to seed them, let the oysters grow before they could dredge and take the harvest. These people were coming in overnight and grabbing the oysters that didn't really belong to them. Again, our friend from Haven said, Oyster monopolists have destroyed a hitherto unrivaled oyster beds of Emsworth. So now let's take stock of the situation in Emsworth in the middle of the 19th century. Are we growing or declining? Well, there were opportunities. In 1847, our railway station opened, giving us much wider markets, both home and away. But there were threats. Boats from France and the south coast were coming into the harbour and fishing and dredging. The Emsworth native oysters had disappeared. However, only large boats could go out into the English Channel and further afield, and in Emsworth we didn't have many of those. The railways also cut the need for sea transport. Those 200 vessels that were coming into Emsworth no longer came because it was much cheaper to transport things by rail. So, 
Unfortunately for Emsworth, things were starting to change. In 1843, the British and French had signed a convention that there would be no dredging in the breeding season. That was important because it allowed the oysters to grow to a bigger size. Also, the Emsworth fishermen formed a dredgerman's cooperative where they worked together. However, we still needed a few things. Businessmen able to invest in equipment. Bigger boats that would allow international dredging out of the harbour. Also, we had to spend money seeding the oyster beds and perhaps take a factory farm approach. We were lucky two men came on the scene. One, John Kennett, and the other, James Duncan Foster. So let me tell you their story. Right, the first businessman I want to talk about is Jack Kennett. He was a local man, born and bred. He came from a family of fishermen. For generations, they plied that trade. And he was to take it on as well, although he expanded it to cover sand and gravel as well, which he brought up and sold for building. He was an end man at the Baptist church, and that meant people trusted him because an end man was the person who went round with the collection plate taking the money. He was also a local councillor for Warblington Urban District Council, which Emsworth came under. And that meant he obviously had the interests of the town at heart. As he built up his business, he built a small fleet of ships, and you can see a list of them here. There were three that could be used for oyster dredging and fishing, two barges which were used to bring the sand and gravel in, but also the boat at the bottom, which I'd like to mention in particular, that's Terra, and she still sails today. Now, this was the sister ship of Grampus. Both of these were designed and built by J.D. Foster, who was um, Jack's main rival, and I'm going to be talking about him next. Jack, like most business people in the Victorian era, had a house overlooking his business interests. So it overlooked the foreshore where the oyster pens were and his boats. And it's still there today. So if you walk around the promenade or uh, mill pond wall, as we, uh, some people call it, you'll actually see it. Let's move now to our second businessman. Here he is, James Duncan Foster or known to everyone as J.D. His father, William Foster, had moved to Emsworth and purchased an existing boatyard. You can see it here coloured in red next to King's Boatyard, uh, coloured blue. Um, they lived in a house which was actually attached uh, to the boatyard. It's called Ivy House in King Street and it's still there today. The first boat he built he named after his wife, Jane E. Foster, and that was in 1861. He had a schoolroom built at the back of the house because they had a large family, although sadly some of the children died of TB. James Duncan was the third born. Sadly, William died in 1890 and he left the boat yard to a Mr. Apps, who'd been his manager foreman. J.D. was energetic, a keen cyclist and racer. Now, he started his business in 1871 by buying 12 oyster pens from a fisherman called Crib. He came up with this idea of paying him £20 annuity for life, which the fisherman accepted. And of course, for him, it was a great deal because he didn't need capital outlay, just £20 a year for the rest of Mr. Cribb's life. He followed this up buying three smacks in 1875 and then went on even further, purchasing David Walker's boat yard at Hendy Quay. He also moved out of the family home down to his own at Homewood. Again, this house still exists in King Street. He then carried on expanding the business by buying oyster pens whenever they came up for sale, as did Jack Kennett, actually. They would often wait uh, for the fishermen to go to the pub and look for some extra cash. In 
He also started what we could call today a vertical industry by buying everything that he needed uh, to complete the process from building a boat to the oyster dredging itself. He also expanded the boat yard. You can see in this map here that we've added J.D. Foster's yard, which is marked in green, covering quite a big area. We can see uh, J.D. Foster's um, shipyard in this photograph taken at the end of the 30s by an RAF aircraft operating out of Thorny Island. As well as the yard, you can see some of his boats moored along the channel. And at the bottom of the picture, logs floating in the mill pond. This is how he seasoned the timber. As I mentioned before, he was building a total vertical industry. He was buying woodland nearby for the timber, using his own transport to get it to the um, yard and then putting it in the mill pond for seasoning. He had his own sawmill uh, with a steam engine, uh, boat building and of course right through to oyster dredging. So this was turning into um, a complete business where he had control over the whole process from felling the timber to dredging for the oysters. To show J.D.'s attention for detail, he went even as far as having his own oyster shucking knives manufactured and used. This one is actually still available to see in the Emsworth Museum. Well, as we can see, J.D. was in a hurry to build his business. It's interesting, not only had he moved out of the family home and bought a house just a hundred yards down the road, but he's also bought a boat yard uh, right at the end of the road they lived in. So rather than going and helping with his father business and perhaps taking it over later on, he decided to set up on his own. Now I have a feeling it's because he was the third son, he wanted to prove something to his father and he was determined to be successful in business. And he certainly was, the business was growing. Not only that, he was building a lot of boats. Uh, look at this list here. So here we have just some of the boats uh, that he was building uh, and their very impressive fleet. Uh, if we look at it, actually, he was building, on average, one boat a year. And here's something I found very interesting. If you take the first letter of each of the ship's names, you'll find it's one of the letters in his name. Notice at the top there's only one A that hasn't been completed. Now, Echo, the boat you can see up there, was the pride of the fleet. It was everything that technology could offer and it could dredge on an enormous scale and I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute but it was so good he decided to build a second boat even better. Uh, we've called it Echo 2 because he never actually named it but I'm certain that letter A would be the one he would have used to make it. So let's look in more detail at that pride of the fleet Echo. I said that Echo was the pride of the fleet, and rightly so. It was large as oyster boats go, 110 foot long, and gross tonnage of 80. It had many innovative features which hadn't been seen before. For example, a water tank. This would be empty when the ship left Emsworth, but when it arrived at the oyster dredging grounds, they would pump in sea water. And therefore, when the oysters were brought up, they could be put straight into the tank and kept fresh and alive until the boat returned to Emsworth. The boat was powered by a steam engine, so when there was no wind and the sails were useless, they could use the propeller. Another innovative feature for oyster boats was uh, galley and crew quarters. It could hold up to 12 crew, which meant you could sail far and wide, and they often did. They went down, for example, to Portugal, so they could be away for a couple of weeks or more. <laughs> and the innovations didn't stop there. The Munford engine was used to power this 54-inch screw, which was held in an iron cage. That meant it couldn't be fouled by the dredgers. Talking about the dredgers, there were five winches, powered by steam engines and donkey boilers. And these were used to pull up the dredgers, 
12 of them, each six feet wide. That gives you an idea of the amount of coverage that this ship could make, increasing the catchers. There's lots of reasons why Echo was the pride of J.D. Foster's fleet. And you can see why he wanted to build another one with perhaps some even more innovative features based on the experience of the crews operating way down across the French and Spanish and Portuguese coasts. However, these large boats were to give J.D. Foster a slight problem. Now look at this picture with the tide in, it looks marvellous. However, at low tide, all you would see is mud with a small channel and shallow one going towards J.D.'s yard. So to moor the large fleet here, you would have to wait till high tide. So he came up with a very innovative idea. Why not put a floating dock halfway out uh, in the deeper water. That meant larger ships could come in pretty well any time of day, disgorge their cargo onto the floating dock. Then small boats could come alongside, take the oysters in small batches back to the foreshore and put them into the uh, pens there. So he came up with the idea of building this dock and it was pretty impressive. A hundred foot long by 50 foot wide, weighing about uh, 3,000 tons. Not only that, it was lined inside so you could fill it with seawater, keeping the oysters fresh until the small boats came alongside and took them away. Right, here in this picture you can see the floating dock under construction. It was never given a name, but we've nicknamed it the Ark. And here it is being built on Hendy's Quay, which by then was part of J.D. Foster's boatyard. This all went well, and on the appointed day, uh, the Ark was about to be launched into the water at high tide. Unfortunately, things didn't go quite as well as they'd planned. First of all, J.D. Foster's dog had run underneath and got crushed. I think this picture was taken just afterwards because you can see people looking down towards the, the bottom of the uh, floating dock. Then they had problems actually rolling it down the ramp into the water. So by the time it actually got there, the high tide was not quite as high as it had been. And by the time they started towing it away, uh, fortunately it got stuck on a mud bank uh, not very far away. And there it stayed. After a number of attempts to uh, float it again, uh, they had to give in. And right till the end, it was stuck in that one position. Here you can see an assimilation of what it would look like. Uh, so there is a ship called Grampus. That was the sister ship of Terror, uh, which uh, Jack Kennett had bought from J.D. Foster. If that wasn't enough, they soon found that the bitumen that they'd used to line the ark to make it watertight was fouling the water and killing the oysters. So I'm afraid in the end, this ark was not really much use at all to the business. However, on the foreshore, it was a hive of activity with many of his men raking and keeping the oysters nicely spread so they grew in the pens a line of horse and carts coming in and taking the daily orders boisters up to the railway station where they were being distributed to london and around the southeast many were eating emsworth oysters in fact jd foster's business was doing so well that by 1898 about three million oysters a year were coming out of emsworth from just jd foster is alone uh, and on top of that, don't forget, there was Jack Kennett and the other fishermen's oysters. So business was certainly booming. Here you can see a map of the foreshore pens. And those in brown and light brown are owned by J.D. Foster and his associate company, Fowley Island Oysters. Right, so now Emsworth is doing really well. At the end of the Victorian um, period, business is booming. And look at business levels, they're going up and up. So Emsworth decided to spend some of that money on improving the town. First of all, uh, Warblington Urban District Council, the centre of gravity had moved to Emsworth. And to show this, we actually built a new town hall in Emsworth.
with a fire station underneath. Next to it was a new hospital built by the town and even the equipment was uh, provided by donation by a townsfolk. It's now become the GP practice for the town. And on top of that we put in a new sewage system right across Emsworth. So things were doing really well. If you remember, I mentioned that in the middle of the 17th century, the population of the town was about 220. Well, by now, it had increased to 2,500, 10 times as many. On top of that, most of the households depended on the uh, boat, uh, boat building and oyster dredging industries. So about 400 jobs. So town, the town was doing really well. Everyone felt uh, 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 well off. Uh, and, and in, living in an improved town. <laughs> Were things going to get any better? As the Victorian period comes to an end in 1901, let's try and take stock of the town's progress and try and look forward to see what's going to happen. Well, up till now, things have been really good. We've had both economic and population growth. Over 5 million oysters a year are sold, including from this shop in Emsworth. We've had major town improvements, including our town hall, hospital, fire station, and a new sewage system. We've also taken over responsibility for the town and for the harbour. So things are pretty good, and the future bodes well for Emsworth. Now, in Victorian times, people didn't go out and have a meal in a restaurant the way we do today. Now, in those days, there weren't many opportunities to go out for a meal. One of the exceptions might have been a mayoral banquet. These were normally held in the town hall or a large hotel in the city. Now, normally it was business people and friends of the mayor who were invited to these dinners. Interestingly, women couldn't go, although they could sit upstairs in the balcony and watch their men eat the meal. Now, on the fateful night I'm going to talk about, there were three mayoral dinners going on in cities in Hampshire. One was in Winchester, one in Southampton, both with just over 130 official guests, and one in Portsmouth with over 200 guests. And Emsworth oysters were on all of their menus. Now, a couple of days later, some of the guests started to feel ill. In fact, about half of them suffered from a salmonella or some other tummy problem. Then, even worse, over a few days, for some, this developed into enteric fever, or typhoid as we call it nowadays. Over a period of two or three weeks, in a few this got worse and eventually ended in death. And this included the Dean of Winchester. Now, he was a very important man, so it was decided to hold a Board of Trade inquiry to find out why. Now, I want to go into more details about both typhoid and the Board of Trade inquiry. Well, first of all, we know it's spread through sewage contaminated food or water. The typhoid fever is life-threatening and it's caused by the salmonella bacteria. Well, the first week, there'll be a rise in temperature, abdominal pain, and salmonella symptoms. So that's what most people get, but it can go on and develop further. You can see in week two, um, a high fever, diarrhea. Uh, week three, it gets even worse, intestinal hemorrhages, or even perforation. And by week four, the patient becomes dehydrated and delirious. It can then end either in death or with the fever starting to reduce. So let's talk now about the specifics of our case. None of the ladies who were sitting up in the gallery were ill, because of course they hadn't had the meal. At Winchester, nine people developed enteric fever. At Southampton, there were ten. And at Portsmouth and ten other local authorities around the southeast of England, there were reports of illness and enteric fever. You might like to know also that at Winchester, one of the waiters was taken ill with enteric fever, and at Southampton, the liftman. 
which would seem to suggest that they were perhaps having some of the food that should have been destined for the guests. We've heard that the Dean of Winchester died. Yes, the very Reverend William Richard Wood Stevens developed diarrhoea and vomiting within 48 hours of the banquet and had a temperature of 102. By the 25th of November, he was diagnosed with enteric fever and sadly died a month later on the 27th of December. The waiter also died at Winchester. So why did Emsworth have its oysters officially banned? Right, I'm now going to go into detail on the cases of enteric fever in Emsworth. And we're very fortunate here that we have the documents created by the Board of Trade Inquiry because these were handed over to the court when the case was heard in London. So we've been able to look at those to get a lot of details. First of all, we know that, like the rest of the country, the number of cases in Emsworth over the turn of the century was increasing. And by 1902, there were 22 cases in Emsworth alone. Let's hone into detail month by month for that year. And as you see at the beginning, there aren't many cases, but there's a peak in October and November when there were nine cases. Also from those documents, we can even tell where each of those cases was and which month they were in. And there's two of particular interest to me anyway. One is uh, in Peter Square and the other is at number 8 South Street. And that particular one was in October. Now, why is this important? Well, the sewer pipe ran right down South Street past number 8 and ended up on the foreshore with the outlet just beside the oyster pens. The inquiry even charted which of the pens that the oysters that went to Winchester came from and they are very close to that outlet. So it seems it's extremely likely that, that the case of enteric fever that caused the infection was that one at 8 South Street. We have some other documents of interest. One is this one which shows the um, food eaten by each of the people who had some infection at the Winchester banquet. So every single th uh, thing they ate has been chartered and there's only one thing in common and that's the oysters, and they all came from Emsworth. Well, by the 19th of December, sales had already fallen to about 50%. The report itself was published in May 1903, and Emsworth oysters were officially blamed. The results were pretty dire. I mean, dredging and oyster sales were banned from the harbour. Warblington Urban District Council was responsible for sewage and therefore they were responsible for the incident. This had a major effect on boat building and other trades because they all relied on the oyster industry. JD tried to carry on in other ports but because he didn't have the infrastructure it failed. The profits evaporated and then were lost. Look here at a Foster's sales. You can see by 1903 they were pretty well down to zero. Emsworth had a population of about 2,500. Half of the jobs in town, about 400, relied on the oyster trade. Right, before I go any further, I just want to spend a couple of minutes giving my views on the two businessmen that I've been talking about and the differences between them. First of all, let's look at Jack. Well, he came from an Emsworth fishing family, so Emsworth was in his blood. Secondly, he was religious. Um, he was an end man at the local Baptist church, which also meant he was trusted by everyone. He was a councillor on Warblington Urban District Council, which Emsworth came under. And that meant he had a big focus on the community and the people who lived in Emsworth. And he took a traditional approach to business. So whether it was oyster dredging or fishing and bringing up sand and gravel, he used traditional methods and had just a small fleet of boats. Now this was very different to JD. First of all, his family were new to Emsworth, so they had no local ties. Secondly, they were pretty well off and the kids were educated. They'd built a, a classroom at the back of the house. 
On top of that, J.D. was driven, I think, to succeed and perhaps show his dad how well he could do, perhaps even better. Uh, and he had great enthusiasm and attention to detail, which meant that when he started his business, he really went for it. He looked after every aspect of it, from felling the timber, to building the boats, to going out oyster dredging, and then looking after the oysters and taking them to market. Now, this difference is going to be very important in the next part of the story. Because when Emsworth had its oysters banned, it meant that their businesses were in trouble. J.D. decided to um, take the uh, council, the Emsworth citizens, to court for compensation. Whereas Jack decided not to. And let's see what happened at the next the case was eventually heard in London on the 25th of March 1906. By then, J.D. had increased his claim to £18,000 plus costs. Both were to give evidence. J.D. said, The council has injured the fishing industry by discharging directly into the harbour. Jack, who gave evidence on behalf of the council, said, Was he not at once a councillor himself? Well, the decision was made on the 14th of May 1906, and damages of just £850 were awarded, a lot less than JD had asked for. Well, the town went wild and thanked its hero. They even presented Jack with a watch, you can see it here with the engraving on the back. And even by the time he died, the town was grateful, and they all turned out for his funeral, and thanked him as its hero. Despite the reduction in the award, um, it was still to have a profound effect on Emsworth. The population actually started to decline, as you can see in this chart here. And let's look at the official national statistics. It even shows up here. In 1903, with the loss of uh, 400 jobs, the population started to go down. And this decline continued for some time. Now, the case had aroused national interest. Councils across the country had been following what was going on uh, in detail. We started to realise the effects of sewage contamination and disease. So new rules were brought in about sewage disposal. Here in Emsworth ourselves, of course, we had to decide what to do. And planning started on a new sewage plant. This was delayed slightly by World War I, however in 1916 it opened up on Thorny Island, which meant we no longer had to dispose of our sewage into the harbour. Now JD tried to carry on the business for some time, he moved his boats further down the coast. However, without the infrastructure, they really struggled to make a profit. So in the end, he decided to abandon that, return the fleet to Emsworth and moored them in the channel. And there they stayed for 60 years, slowly rotting away. In the 1970s, it was decided to break them up and burn them because they'd become a navigation hazard, because by then the town had become a thriving sailing centre with two sailing clubs and a lot of motor cruisers. Now, um, the boatyards as well, of course, they had no boats to build, so slowly they were being broken up uh, and housing built in their place. The last one to go was J.D. Foster's yard. You can see a picture taken here shortly before it was um, broken up and new housing built on the site. Although 400 jobs had disappeared in Emsworth, the railways allowed mobility so those people out of work could go and look for jobs elsewhere. In the town we started a major building program and if you remember because of our market charter we were a thriving retail and service town. Over the years a number of attempts were made at bringing back the oyster industry. At the end of World War I, uh, P.G. Woodhouse, who was a resident in Emsworth, even mentioned the oyster scare in one of his books. In 1937, Jack Kennett himself tried to restart the industry by bringing in 40,000 young oysters from Brittany and laid them in the harbour. 
Unfortunately, when war broke out in 1939, he, were to, he was to lose 90,000 oysters because of wartime restrictions. Nothing could be done to harvest them. Following the Second World War, a number of attempts were made over the years to restock the oysters in the harbour. For example, one using Pacific oysters. However, they didn't thrive because of the colder water here. Emsworth is a thriving town and it became a boat destination. We have two sailing clubs, so we had lots of boats coming into the harbour. Unfortunately, the anti-fouling paint that was used uh, was causing contamination and killing the oysters. That fouling paint has now been banned. However, in November, which is the main season for dredging, boats came from far and wide for a while, but soon the stock had disappeared and the last major wide-scale dredging in the harbour was in November 2012. It was then banned by the Harbour Conservancy, not just because of the fact there weren't many oysters, but also by then we'd realised the environmental damage that was being done by the dredgers scraping along the, uh, the bed. I'd like to say a few thank yous now. First of all, one to the late Linda Newell. Sadly, she's no longer with us, but much of this material was put together by her, and she put it into a booklet which is available from the Emsworth Museum. A thank you also to Trevor Davis. He represents both the Chichester and District Archaeological Society as well as the Emsworth Maritime and Historical Trust. Thank yous to a couple of boat owners. Bill Dredge, who took me out on that last November day that dredging was allowed in the harbour. And also to Alan Aitken, whose boat I'm in now. Well, also, of course, I can't forget Chichester Harbour Conservancy, who helped me enormously. Thank you to all of them, and perhaps I'll see you all another day.